All right, thank you, Mirka. Good morning, everybody, far and near. Uh, let's ask God to bless our time. Heavenly Father, thank you once again uh, that you are always available. Help us to be more available to you. And uh, so to that end, we ask your blessing on our time together this morning. Uh, may it really do all that you've intended. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this uh, is a, a review. It seems like we've been reviewing for ages, but reviewing uh, the ground we've covered and, and hopefully some new ground regarding covenants, covenants in the Bible. Now, I have an outline here that I'm following, and I'd like you to picture in your own mind uh, as much as possible four columns. The left hand side will be basically the name of the covenant. So, uh, covenant with Adam, covenant with Noah, and so on. And there are more sophisticated sounding titles that I'm not going to use, uh, not because you're not sophisticated. I'm just uh, wanting to be clearer. Uh, so that's the left-hand column, God's covenant and the people he made the covenant with. Second column is the obedience of the people that are uh, dealing with God and the covenant. Uh, the third column is disobedience uh, on the part of the same people. And so far, I've not found any that were not disobedient except Jeremiah. And we have to do further research there. I don't think he could be an exception. Uh, but that's the third column. So God's covenant with whom is the first column, then the obedience column, then the disobedience column. And then finally, uh, over on the right-hand side of my outline uh, is God's grace, expressions of God's grace in all of this. And that's, of course, the reason why we're here at all, is God's grace. All right, so first of all, God's covenant with Adam. And unofficially, God made a covenant with Adam and Eve. Uh, other covenants like that made with Noah or Abraham and so on are identified in the scripture as a covenant. Uh, but the idea of covenant where it's a relationship, a bond that has been achieved by sacrifice so a bond in blood it's been called um, and this uh, special relationship this bond in blood is something that is the initiative of God and he's the one who sovereignly makes all this happen so we're in between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ all of that is part uh, of God's uh, strategy and, and uh, work with his creation uh, that is spoken of in scripture in this special way uh, of the covenant. All right, so Adam, what was the task um, that he uh, fulfilled, was obedient in? Genesis chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. Genesis 2, 
19 and 20. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field, all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, and the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. And, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So that's moving into another area, but uh, Adam was obedient in this job, this task that God gave to him, which was to name the animals, name the creatures. Um, and what is the significance of the naming of something? Well, usually when we think of naming, it's in connection with uh, naming some newborn baby. Um, but you have also the naming of ships and the uh, ceremony of smashing a bottle of champagne on the bow of the ship uh, as part of uh, the ceremony. So there's naming of various kinds of things. For Adam, the naming of the animals was part and parcel of God's charge to the first people, Adam and Eve, the charge to subdue the earth. Uh, part of that charge was to multiply themselves but then also to subdue the earth and all that's in it. And that subduing was uh, a matter of people, Adam in this case and Eve, uh, being uh, responsible for what happened in the animal realm. Uh, we could think of it more broadly as what happened in the creation itself or the culture. And uh, the book of Genesis goes on to speak about those who were the first to form uh, cities and various other things, those who were artists. Uh, and then eventually the whole lot of the people uh, in their effort to build some kind of structure that would uh, guarantee their being able to be one people and not be uh, dissipated throughout the earth. The Tower of Babel, as it's been called. Uh, so people were identified early on as uh, fulfilling various roles that we would call simply cultural matters. Uh, but for Adam, it was uh, a matter of demonstrating the fact that uh, the animal kingdom was to be subservient to Adam and Eve, to people. Uh, that was uh, established early on. So uh, here is Adam naming the animals. Okay, now uh, Genesis 2, 18. Uh, this is then moving into another area, moving into that uh, of God's grace. So Genesis 2, 18, please turn to that. And we see there the Lord God saying, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And then, as we saw a moment ago, verse 20, the last part of it, uh, the statement is made. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So we can surmise that part of this 
naming business uh, also included a search for uh, a suitable companion for Adam, but not this one. All right, so uh, God promises that he will do this. And then we know that uh, Eve was uh, uh, what God or who God supplied. Verse 21 of chapter 2 goes on to say, the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. Verse 23, the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And then this is uh, associated with marriage, verse 24, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. So, God promised a companion suitable for Adam, and then uh, we find the description of what he did uh, in providing that companion. And it's interesting, just noting in passing, that uh, there is no other account in any of the ancient accounts of uh, the origin of things or creation. Uh, none of these mention the creation of woman. Only the Bible does. So it's interesting. Uh, that would not be inconsistent with God's regarding woman as being equal in value and significance uh, to the man uh, and uh, different, obviously, but also uh, of equal significance in God's sight. So just mention that as part of the reality of this account. Now, God did uh, deal with Eve uh, independently. We see this in Genesis chapter 3, uh, verses 2 and 3, where we have this. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Now, the woman was responding to that subtle, uh, rebellious statement, question that had been posed to the woman uh, by the serpent. And the serpent had said, this is verse one of chapter three. The serpent said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Well, what's implied in that question? What is, what is the serpent getting at here? What is the serpent suggesting to eat? Well, it's sort of the unbelief of the serpent and and wondering out loud and including woman in his audience. Uh, how could God be so uh, petty? Really, it's lying here uh, as to forbid uh, the couple, the first couple from eating uh, of, of this tree, the fruit of this tree. And uh, notice the woman's first response here is uh, pretty straightforward. There's nothing wrong with it, really. 
woman and answering the serpent, verse two, that we just looked at. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees of the garden. In other words, God has been very gracious to us. He's given us uh, a whole garden uh, that is for us to enjoy. Uh, but then she goes on to say, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. So the woman is saying, all right, this is the record. For the record, you're asking servants, you're asking uh, uh, about the behavior of God, as it were. Did God really say that to you? Um, so uh, in the midst of that, the woman says, all right, look, uh, we, we really have a gracious God. <laughs> we, you may eat. We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But then, as a matter of fact, God did limit that uh, uh, ability. You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. Well, uh, all right, that's Eve's first response is one of obedience, we have to say. We don't usually think of that way. We usually uh, think, well, Eve is the one who disobeyed. Well, she did disobey. And that we see uh, in verse 6 of chapter 3. So here it says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. All right, so there is the disobedience. And uh, then in the midst of the disobedience, we have evidences of God's grace being uh, operative. So Genesis chapter 3, 8 and 9. And we mentioned this on another occasion, that here is God associating with uh, this couple who just sinned and gone against his directive. So uh, we have in verse 8, um, yes, verse 8 and 9. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Uh, not uh, apparently uh, fearful of bumping into this sinful pair. Uh, but just enjoying the garden and the cool of the day. And the passage goes on to say, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The Lord God called to the man, where are you? So there's the initiative on God's part to maintain the relationship in spite of the sinfulness. All right, so that's gracious. Um, God also protected the couple. And how is this achieved? Please turn to verse 22 in chapter 3, verses 22 to 24. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the garden of Eden, cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So God's going to limit the amount of 
rebellion that Adam and Eve can uh, find to do uh, it's not going to be eating from the tree of life uh, because then that would uh, establish the sinfulness and the results of the sinfulness of Adam and Eve. So he's going to make sure they don't partake of that tree. Um, it's all speculation as to what might have happened if Adam and Eve had passed the test and had obeyed God in this command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Would they still have been, had access to the tree of life? Well, God is making sure they don't. And he's protecting them in that sense from themselves. Uh, what did God provide uh, in the midst of all of this? Verse 21. Uh, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And then the uh, earlier allusion to this uh, was uh, Adam saying to God when God said, where are you? Uh, he said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. So um, God provides uh, a more effective covering. Um, Adam and Eve had sewn together leaves uh, to cover themselves, and God made garments of skin. Um, so it's probably a, a matter of it being practically more uh, effective, but also there has to be some uh, hint here of God's willingness to see bloodshed uh, in his own creation uh, for the sake of providing what his couple is Adam and Eve needed. And, and so there would seem to be uh, at least the slightest hint that God was going to allow sacrifice uh, in order to benefit his couple. Uh, and this becomes clear later on when God did establish the sacrificial laws as he gave them to his people through Moses. Uh, but also uh, with Noah, when God directed Noah to uh, take not just simply of one pair of each kind of animal and bird and so on, uh, but also seven pairs in order that there might be sacrifice. So um, there is that uh, very subtle pointing forward to God's provision of Jesus Christ on the cross, uh, all the way back here with the first couple. And then there was uh, God's gracious promise with regard to the serpent. What was it? Well, chapter 3, uh, verse 15, spells it out. God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's speaking to the serpent here. Between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So this is taken then as scripture unfolds as a, a promise that eventually uh, the serpent will be destroyed. And uh, we find in the book of Revelation that 
this destruction of the serpent uh, identified later on as Satan, uh, that this destruction is ongoing uh, and will never end. And so this is the fate, if you will, of Satan represented by the serpent in the garden. All right, um, we'll move on now to Noah. Um, and so we come to Genesis 6, already mentioned this matter of the sacrifice. Uh, 6, verse 22. Uh, speaks here of Noah's obedience um, where it says Noah did everything just as God commanded him. So he, he was obedient, period. Um, why did God honors, honor Noah's sacrifice which we find described in Genesis chapter eight, verses 20 and 21. So Genesis eight, 20 and 21. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. And then a very anthropomorphic view of God here, very human rendering, uh, alludes to the Lord in verse 21, smelling the pleasant aroma. And the Lord said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. And then this poem, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. So God will maintain the order that uh, he had initiated in the creation of things. All right, so then um, 20 and 21, uh, the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, never again will I curse. So, uh, why did God accept Noah's sacrifice? Do we have any inclin uh, inclination here? to indicate why it just was pleasing, smell the pleasing aroma. But we have to realize that God is the one all the way through the scriptures who has indicated that he would do whatever was necessary to be able to uh, pardon and redeem his people, even if it meant the sending of his own son Onto the cross. And so we have John 3 16, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only son, whoever believes in him will not perish. God knew with Noah what he was going to do with Jesus. Uh, this was no secret to God. God was the one who planned the sacrifice of his son from before the creation of the world. It was something that uh, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, and uh, also uh, by implication, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, before any of this was created, before there was any creation of Adam and Eve, before there was the fall in the garden, uh, before Noah offered uh, the sacrifices, before any of that, God had decided to send his son that uh, people might be forgiven. 
on the basis of what God did for, for them. All right, so uh, God honored Noah's sacrifice ultimately uh, because he honored the sacrifice of his own son. Uh, it was uh, pleasing to God uh, because it recognized the sacrifices, recognized that God was holy, his character was holy. There was to be obedience, perfect obedience uh, to him um, by those who were created by him. Uh, and uh, th that this was the essence of the death of Christ on the cross. It was to recognize that Sin deserves punishment and will be punished. It's just God graciously spares us from the punishment that we deserve and uh, took it upon himself. All right, that's a lot that's implied here. That, uh, we have been and will continue to be unpacking for the rest of the scripture. Uh, what else did God allow? Uh, here with Noah. Look at chapter 9 of Genesis 24 to 27. Uh, Noah, <laughs> um, it says, we'll back up to verse 20. Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard when he drank some of its wine he became drunk and lay uncovered inside his tent and then verse 24 when noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him he said cursed be canaan the lowest of slaves will he be to his brothers he also said blessed be the lord the god of shem May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend the territory of Japheth. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem. And may Canaan be his slave. So uh, apparently uh, the youngest son, Canaan, had done something further that was sinful. Uh, the other two brothers, of the other two sons of Noah uh, took pains to try to protect uh, their father who laying there drunk in his naked state uh, from any further embarrassment or shame. So the two sons of Noah uh, were honorable in dealing with this development. Not so the third son, the youngest one, uh, Canaan, and so Canaan was cursed by Noah. But what did God allow here by virtue of the sin uh, of uh, of Noah getting drunk, uh, escaping uh, in a way that the Bible never really condones anywhere? Um, so uh, what is God allowing? He's allowing the sinfulness to play itself out in um, spoiled relationships within the family. And if that hasn't been a consistent theme throughout history, what has it been? Uh, and God allows it. Why does he allow this disruption? I think the simplest answer is that he wants people to recognize that there are consequences of sin, consequences of going against God's will. And uh, these consequences are difficult to live with. This was true certainly with David in his sinning against Uriah and Bathsheba. Uh, in doing so, of course, he's sinning against God, but uh, in that uh, sin, uh, there was a consequence that followed that, because ever since that uh, rebellion against God, uh, the uh, family 
uh, was uh, in turmoil. David's son rebelled against him and sought to dethrone his own father. Absalom did that. Uh, so other members of David's family were affected by David's sin. God allowed that to play out. And uh, David uh, led a, a pretty miserable life after that event. So God allows uh, sin to have its full effect. Uh, but at the same time, God doesn't allow uh, the sinfulness of uh, humanity to feed his plan to uh, create for himself a household of faith, create for himself a remnant of people faithful to him. So uh, how was Abraham obedient? We're moving ahead now to Genesis 12. Uh, covenant with Noah uh, and its attendant sign, the rainbow, uh, has already been uh, a thing of the past for many centuries. And then there's Abraham, covenant with Abraham. How is he obedient? Chapter 12 of Genesis, verses 1 through 4. The Lord had said to Abraham, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And verse 4. So Abraham left, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Aaron. He took his wife, Sarai, his nephew, Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. So Abraham was obedient. God just said, go, leave your country, leave your people. Leave all that is familiar to you and go to the land that I have directed you to go to. And so, uh, without further ado, uh, these three words in verse four. So Abraham left. And uh, that's what we as believers today uh, need to ask God to help us to do too. As soon as it becomes clear, it's not always clear. Abraham didn't know anything about Canaan until God came to him and said, this is my plan for you, go. Uh, but as soon as it becomes clear to us what God wants for us, uh, then there's to be uh, ob obedience, full and uh, prompt with no equivocation. All right, uh, what about Abraham's sin? Well, let's uh, press on in chapter 12, uh, reading verses 10 through 16. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake 
and my life will be spared because of you. This reflects a, a practice that actually was happening uh, in Abraham's day, that uh, if a king, someone uh, with power and authority, uh, saw a married woman that he wanted to take for his own wife, uh, he couldn't do this without killing the husband first. That somehow means, okay, go ahead. David did that himself. Pardon? David did that. David did that. He did indeed. And uh, it, it wasn't any more righteous in David's day than it was in Abraham's. But here is Abraham uh, understanding the customs uh, that he was uh, living with uh, and recognizing uh, that uh, he was vulnerable because of his wife, Sarah, uh, took her aside and uh, set that up. In verse 14, when Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that she was a very beautiful woman. Verse 15, and when Pharaoh's officials, officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abraham well for her sake, and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, men servants, and maid servants, and camels. And then it goes on uh, to say that the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household. That doesn't seem very fair at first, but uh, there it is. But Abraham's sin was that he took things into his own hands. He did not uh, have any confidence that God would be able to protect him. Uh, so he finagled this strategy with his wife, uh, whereby she would claim to be the sister of Abraham. It turns out that uh sarah was according to the genealogies related to abraham uh so there was some truth in her being identified as abraham's sister but that was not the whole of it by any means uh so um that was abraham's sin he was not uh, trusting in god uh, chapter 15, continuing with the saga of Abraham, uh, again, we see his obedience. We've seen Abraham's obedience before. God said to him, go, leave your land, your family, your people. He went, that was obedient. Abraham was disobedient by not trusting the Lord when he went down to Egypt and causing his wife to uh, tell a half-truth at best. But now he's obedient again. Chapter 15, let's read verses 2 through 6. Chapter 15 of Genesis. Verses 2 through 6. But Abraham said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no children. So a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed God, and he credited it to him as righteousness. Actually, the word is Abraham believed the Lord. And in the NIV, all the letters are capitalized as has been the case uh, previous to this and these other passages in, in Genesis, uh, God is spoken of 
uh, most consistently as the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, and that name, Lord, what is translated into English as Lord with all capitals. This uh, uh, was the covenant name that God revealed to Moses when God had asked Moses to go down to Egypt and confront Pharaoh. And uh, Moses said, well, what shall I tell the people? There are gods all over the place. What's your name? And that's when God said, it's, it's the Lord. Yahweh is the way it's pronounced today. That's the best guess anyway. Um, because the name was considered to be so sacred that it was not pronounced for long periods of time. And people forgot how to pronounce the name that had four consonants and no vowels. Y-H-W-H. And so people sort of made a guess as to how to pronounce it. Uh, and the best guess that scholars have come up with uh, that obtains today is Yahweh. Used to be Jehovah. Uh, now it's Yahweh. But in any case, uh, when you see that in the scriptures, this spelling, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that's the name Yahweh. That's the covenant name uh, that God used with his people. Okay. Um, in what ways did God show himself gracious? Chapter 17 of Genesis, verses 15 to 22. Chapter 17, verses 15 to 22. God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Abraham fell face down. He laughed, said to himself, will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Ishmael was the son by uh, his, another wife. If only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Then God said, yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son. And you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers, and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. When he had finished speaking with Abraham, God went up from him. All right, so God. Uh, is graciously planning that uh, Abraham and Sarah, uh, both in their own day, old age, will nevertheless conceive and bear a son. Uh, and that will be the son of the promise, be the son of the covenant. Um, one more thing I think we may have time for. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe a couple things, but one more thing about Abraham. Where would God provide what he was going to provide? Genesis 22, verses 1 through 14. This well-known passage where Abraham takes his son to sacrifice him on the mountain. Uh, which mountain, where would it be? 
Genesis 22, verses 1 through 14. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering, as one of the, on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Let me pause to just uh, remind us not to miss the significance of the word we. Abraham said to his servants, uh, we'll go to this place over there and we will worship. We will worship. That's Isaac and himself. And then we will come back to you. How could... Abraham say that when he was planning to kill his son. Why not? I will come back to you. But we will worship and then we will come back to you. It's on the basis of that statement uh, that the author of Hebrews in the New Testament uh, recognized that Abraham actually considered that God was able to raise his son from the dead. So that was what was going on. We have this little glimpse of the mind of, of Abraham uh, in the midst of this uh, ordeal, this trial. And we need to recognize the word trial in both Hebrew and in Greek means temptation as well as trial. It could be read either way. So... Uh, the scripture here speaks of God testing Abraham, the trial, but it also was uh, intended by Satan to be a temptation, which uh, happily Abraham didn't have to But we will worship and then we will come back. All right. So, um, where was this? This was Moriah, later to be identified as the mountain or ridge of mountains upon which uh, Jesus was sacrificed. It was the cross of Christ, of Gethsemane, that uh, was the location that God directed Abraham to in this instance here. So, um, on the Mount of the Lord, it will be provided. And that is the uh, sentence that is repeated here in this passage. But in verse 14, you see that? Chapter 22. Uh, verse 14. Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. It means reference to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. All right. Um, let's see. Let's pop up right there. Moses. How is he a meeting? Well, um, there's a passage that we'll go into on another occasion. Detail. But uh, this is the whole episode of Moses with 
God and the burning bush and God's getting Moses' attention uh, by this bush out there in the wilderness uh, that was burning but wasn't consumed. And on the uh, occasion of Moses going over there to check it out and see what, what was going on, uh, he hears a voice from heaven. Uh, take off your shoes, your sandals, for the ground in which you're standing is holy ground. And then Moses recognized the voice of God was speaking to him. And God speaking to him said, you're to go to Egypt and you're to free my people. Uh, their chains uh, and their plight there was coming. I know this God said it. And uh, I love the freedom that the author here, Moses, has to speak of God uh, in a very human way, as well as in a divine way. It's, it's wonderful. Um, but here it is, uh, God noticing the agony of his people says, all right, you're the one. Right. You're the one. This is in uh, Exodus chapter Three. And uh, verse seven, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people. I've heard them crying out because of the slave drivers. So I've come down to rescue them. And then he goes on to say, I'm sending you to Pharaoh. And of course, Moses says, well, I'm not really uh, all that you think I, I am, not the one. To go for various reasons. And then he trots out these reasons. God finally loses patience when Moses said, I'm not very good at speaking. God, being angry by this time, says, I'm sending you along with Aaron, your brother. He's eloquent. He'll be able, you put the words in his mouth. And he'll speak for you. So don't worry. And uh, so eventually, however, Moses um, goes. Chapter 5, verse 1, and we'll end there. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, and then there was that whole uh, drama of Moses performing various miracles, God performing through Moses. Uh, and finally, when the firstborn sons of the Egyptians die, uh, that's when uh, Pharaoh could hold out the water so they go. And the people. All right, uh, we'll leave it there and pick it up uh, next time. This matter of the uh, obedience, remarkable obedience. There's something about Abraham just picking up and leaving, going to a country that he had no idea what it was all about. No relatives there, no friends there, no fellow classmates to connect with. I mean, there's nobody. Um, so there's God's servants are obedient in wonderful ways, but then they're disobedient in very clear ways as well. So, uh, what are we left with? We're left with the call by God to be faithful and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ uh, to all people. And we know we're not perfect. We know we're flawed. Uh, but we also know the Lord God. And that was the basis on which these servants of God uh, were able to be faithful. They knew him. They walked with him. So let's pray and ask God's help in this. Heavenly Father, we are uh, looking at your dealing with your uh, servants over the years and the centuries, the millennia. We're looking at this and we're recognizing that uh, you likewise have given each of your children who have loved and trusted your son uh, to be those who advertise 
uh, who promote, who make clear the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, to others. And so, Lord, uh, help us to be faithful in our uh, obedience to you in little matters and large uh, right through this day so that we can honor you and in some way you will use us to advance your kingdom. Thank you so much that this is a realistic prayer because of who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes. Um, I have 